This is Dr. Mirdalis Diaz Ramirez, and this is the Design Your Physician Life podcast. Welcome to this episode brought to you by our Max Allure Mastermind, a personal and professional development program for physicians. Today, we have a very wonderful guest. His name is Dr. Peter Statz, and we're going to be talking about building a career of innovation in pain medicine. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Design Your Physician Life podcast where you will get excited about being a physician, learn the tools that can help boost your success, and great tips from successful doctors. Join us to unlock the keys to an amazing physician life. And now, here's your host, Dr. Mirdalis Diaz Ramirez. Hey guys, I'm extremely excited today. I have here a wonderful mentor and friend, Dr. Peter Statz. Thank you for being here. He is an American physician, educator, author, inventor, and clinical researcher specializing in interventional pain medicine. He was the founder of the Division of Pain Medicine in Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in 1994 and served as its director for 10 years. He has trained fellows and residents from all over the world in pain management and neuromodulation and is past president at the North American Modulation and Neuromodulation Society, the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, the New Jersey Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, and the Southern Pain Physician Societies. He's currently the medical chief officer of National Spine and Pain Centers, the largest pain practice in the U.S., and co-founder of ElectroCore, a medical device company specializing in non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. He has authored a bunch of books, articles, and he's here with us today. Besides that, if you haven't seen a recent TV ads, he has also created, he's a creator of Cutensa, a patch that helps patients with post-herpetic um, neuralgia pain, and has also worked on another uh, project that's called Preout. He's the current president of the World Institute of Pain, chairman of the Vegas Nerve Society, and the chief medical officer of that big, large group, Pain Group National Spine and Pain Center. Thank you for being here, Peter Stats. Ah, oh, thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, oh my goodness. You have done tons and tons of things. You have really guided us um, as an interventional pain doctor for over 20 years of my life. You have been part of it, um, you know, directly and indirectly for all that time. And, um, but it wasn't always like that, right? Tell us about your childhood first before we get to this busy, busy life. Tell us about time out. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, well, I, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, change has always been in my DNA. I was brought up by two psychologists and my father was an innovator um, and somebody who always challenged the status quo. He came up with his own theories of psychology that are somewhat widely used today, integrating different aspects of classical conditioning and operant conditioning to make what was called psychological behaviorism. Uh, but in addition, part of his theories made new projections to ideas. And one of his ideas that has really uh, taken foot and really somewhat popularized is the idea of timeout. Uh, Dad was the inventor of the idea of timeout. And uh, I guess that's part of change. Prior to, prior to his invention of timeout, uh, the kids typically got a beating when they were bad. And after that, uh, it was a little bit nicer. So lots of kids have, oh, my dad had a little thank you for that. So you've been in research, doing research for a very long part of your life. And I think that you were the lab subject of your dad giving you the timeouts <laughs> when you were little. <laughs> yes, I think so. So he's been, he was a researcher, you know, inventor, as I, as you're saying, um, do you think that was a big reason of you becoming interested in research these days? I, I think so. It, more so than research per se, it was really a way of looking at the world, a paradigm of saying, okay, well, here's what we know today. What can we do for the next generation of ideas and moving things forward? And that's what I think the gift my father gave me is an ability to kind of not accept what everybody else is doing but to look beyond into the future to say, maybe we can do this in a better way and have a real solid foundation of why that is. And then um, the fortitude to push it forward and try to create new ideas and develop new strategies. So in terms 
of the generation, you know, generations uh, before we would be victims of the belt, the leather belt. Uh, mm -hmm. So in your household, you didn't have that? No, not a bit. Not, no belts in my family. It was, um, it was all positive reinforcement and then uh, removal of aversive behaviors just by removing one from the environment. So he, he was a very loving guy who really uh, thought that it was a better strategy to bring up kids by just reinforcing the behaviors that you want. That's awesome. So as a child, were you thinking about becoming a doctor? What were you thinking about as a child? Who was the one who decided to become a physician? The child, the teenager? Who was that? I'm not sure if I have figured it out yet, but I think mm -hmm. uh, somewhere along the lines, I knew that I was going to go to medical school, probably in, as a teenager, I thought that would be a good path for myself. And you went to medical school and eventually you went into, you know, residency. How did you choose your residency and how did you choose your fellowship or, you know, your, your next steps? Well, I actually um, went to medical school with the plan of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, while I was doing my rotation with the orthopedic surgeons, I just was actually bored with it. It didn't seem to be interesting. And I think it was a function of just chance because had I been with a different professor, I probably would have looked at the world a little bit differently. Um, and so I was trying to figure out what to do. Uh, as it happens, I did uh, I applied for an anesthesia uh, residency uh, at Johns Hopkins, and I applied for a psychiatry residency at Harvard, trying to figure out, well, what's the great new frontier? And when I met with Dr. Rogers, our chairman of anesthesia, he said, anesthesia can be whatever you want it to be. This is not about putting people to sleep and waking them back up, but this is about establishing what is sleep or how do nerves function or what is pain, and you could go build it. And Dr. Rogers' uh, vision really aligned with mine, and I was uh, sold and uh, signed right there on the spot and never actually went to an interview uh, past the Hopkins interview. That's wonderful. You know, what an inspiring way of, of seeing it and, and telling you these things, because many times he's the mentor, as you said, you know, you got the, the one from orthopedic surgery and then you got the one from anesthesiology and what different visions, huh? It's, okay. it's amazing. So that, that's, that's so important for us and um, very fortunate for you to have found and fortunate for us that you found that pathway on, on, in anesthesiology. Subsequent mm -hmm. to that, you were then eventually uh, created some department, a little department there, right? Of a little yeah, um, of pain management, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so, so prior to uh, my being at Hopkins, we had great expertise in pain management as it happened with Dr. Srinivasa Raja was one of my, um, uh, was my, one of my professors and mentors. There was um, a robust neurosurgery department with people like Don Long, uh, who was among the first people to put in spinal cord stimulators uh, in a different department. And um, at that time, anesthesiologists were not allowed to do any kind of surgery uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins or any academic place. But with the, with the current chairman and uh, a vision for trying to do things differently again, we created a division of pain medicine within the Department of Anesthesia. Dr. Miller, the new chairman, uh, came in and uh, he uh, had the foresight to allow me to have privileges uh, to implant devices. I got, I was the first anesthesiologist to have surgical privileges to implant spinal cord stimulators and implantable pumps. And um, uh, really, I think was part of the change that we see today that all of our colleagues are able to do spinal cord stimulators and implantable pumps um, because Dr. Miller gave, had the vision that it was appropriate to move our field forward and not be a hundred years of history, but have some progress there as well. So uh, that was an important step for our field, I think, creating our division of pain medicine, which was really an interventional pain program. That's, that's the history right there of interventional pain management in the making. And we have to thank also that boring orthopedic rotation that uh -huh. you had, because you had some surgical skills that probably Dr. Miller also saw 
uh, that that contributed to maybe putting you in that position. And then um, here you, here we are. I um, I had a conversation the other day with Nilesh Patel, and um, we were talking about how interventional pain management is becoming what interventional cardiology has been to um, cardiothoracic surgery in our cases for spine surgery. And having seen the progress and uh, the development, it's just been amazing what we can offer our patients now and safely offer them and, and have such great results. And we wouldn't have not had those things without, you know, visionaries like Dr. Miller and yourself looking for these changes, bringing that innovation for our patients. So that's, that's been, um, it's been quite exciting to be part of that um, transition, that whole movement, that, that evolution of, of interventional pain management. And uh, yeah, well, I think you're right. I, one of the uh, the uh, um, arguments that I used was at that time, cardiologists had to argue with the cardiac surgeons about who's going to put in a pacemaker. And it really became pretty evident that this was just a small incision um, to uh, implant a little pacemaker. And I, I used that argument when I wanted to argue that anesthesiologists should be able to implant a small little pacemaker in the spine because we were all, already placing electrodes in the spine and we were already placing epidural catheters. So that wasn't a big step, but it was that little incision that seemed to hold up our advancement. And um, I, I guess we all owe a debt of gratitude to the fields that come before us like cardiology who um, made that foundational step that allowed us to be making little incisions to implant a device. That's awesome. And then within that career, you found yourself being involved in research that right now is providing wonderful uh, treatments for our patients. Let's start with, um, I, I think Prealt came before Kutensa, correct for you? Well, I think actually- It was like, they're like around the same time. Similar. Cutenza, my, my patents on Cutenza were issued in 1996. And I started okay. working on that a little bit before that. Um, so I think, uh, Cutenza came first, uh, pre was also in the early, early 1990s. Um, but taking it from the idea of, an, uh, translational research and Bill Burroughs had done a small study in San Francisco, uh, up at, at the Stanford university, looking at, uh, pre -alt. And then we, uh, led the largest clinical trial on pre alt for cancer and HIV related pain. So even though our listeners, they're uh, for the most part physicians, not everybody might be familiar with these therapies. So let's explain what Cutensa is, how you came up with the idea. And we're going to talk a little bit about patent doing, you know, like doing your patent. Sure. So um, Cutensa is really high dose capsation. And uh, I, came up with the idea with a good friend, Marco Papagallo, who was a neurologist at the time, um, when we recognized that uh, while we were studying the mechanisms of pain using uh, cute, um, injectable capsation, we would inject ourselves, which hurt a lot. And then we would look for hyperalgesia. Wait, wait, wait. You were injecting yourself with capsaicin? <laughs> we did. We did. And that was pretty foolish. But um, oh that's goodness. under you know uh, Jim Campbell's lab and, and Dick Meyer's uh, lab. Uh, we were looking at mechanisms. You are, you are so there were there was an escape of anesthetic gas in the OR. <laughs> you guys were like flying high when you were injecting. No, I don't think so. We were just <laughs> young uh, investigators looking to figure things out. Um, but but one of the things that was noted was that after you did the injection, there was an area uh, within the injected field that um, was become insensate to pain. Um, and prior to us, there was low dose capsation that you could buy over the counter, but it was really the high dose capsation that, uh, um, that allowed for us to treat pain. And uh, the first patient that Marco and I treated was an HIV related patient. We wanted to see if this would work. So we put high dose cream uh, on one foot and uh, placebo cream on the other foot. And the patient uh, had significant improvement in pain in the one foot. 
Uh, later, a, a fellow of mine uh, became involved with us. Um, actually, much later, became involved with us. But we, um, you know, we we then put it on the uh, 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 Saran wrap like thing before we put it on uh, the foot. Effectively, the first patch that was used. Uh, and we showed that we could improve pain. And, and then finally, one of my fellows, Wendy Robbins, went to UC San Francisco and loved the idea and started a research project at UCSF. So there was a there was a long transition of us using the device initially under anesthesia to, to, the, to the point is having to use an epidural anesthetic to mitigate the pain of the uh, topical capsation. And now the companies that have developed this have figured out how to do this without having to put in an epidural catheter or something like that. But it, it was, uh, you know, it's a long road. This was 19, early 1990s. It's uh, almost 30 years that I've been working on this. And as you mentioned, I saw on the news this morning, not on the news, but I was watching the news this morning, I saw an advertisement for Cutenza. So this is an incredibly, incredibly long path. It's amazing. I I did um, treat patients in that way with the epidural or the spinals and then giving them the high dose under the saran wrap of, of capsaicin for the neuropathies. And the change was amazing. And subsequent yeah. to that, you know, during the last, um, I don't know, it's been like 15 years, I think when, how long it came to market, we've been treating patients uh, with Cutenza as well. And tell us about the patents. How, when did you decide to submit a patent and what was that process like for you? Well, I've actually submitted many patents over the years. Um, some have worked out well, some have not worked out so well. So that's, I think, a key lesson here. Uh, early on, uh, uh, I submitted a patent with Rob Greenberg on uh, creating the first electronic medical record. And I did it through Hopkins. And <clears throat> Hopkins didn't think that there was a there there on it, an electronic medical record. So didn't push forward on the patent related issues. Um, something I obviously continue to regret uh, moving forward. Uh, the, I also worked in other uh, pharmaceutical related areas. One was something the company that I worked with a guy named Joel McCleary um, <clears throat> on creating a topical agent out of kava kava, which is a, an herb from Micronesia now grown in Hawaii, and we figured out uh, how to isolate the active compounds in this kava kava uh, that were really quite analgesic as a topical agent and filed some patents on that. And unfortunately, about the time that we filed the patents and figured out how to make uh, this topical agent with a specific dihydrocarbon lactone uh, uh, isolate, uh, there were also isolates that actually showed that were liver toxic, but the press picked up that kava was liver toxic and it really kind of shattered the whole company uh, of what we were trying to do with topical kava kava. Even though we're pretty sure that the isolates that we had were not toxic, just it would be impossible to raise money with the press that was going on um, around that. And then um, uh, Wendy through UC San Francisco in, in collaboration with me and Marco uh, filed the patent, next patents on uh, topical capsation. Um, so th those were some early patents and then later patents that I worked on were around vagal nerve stimulation. Oh, most recently um, we filed some patents uh, that uh, are not issued yet on improving survival with telomeres uh, lengthening with vagal nerve stimulation. So this is a process that's kind of constantly ongoing, understanding um, where there's a hole in our knowledge and seeing if we can uh, advance that area with, with patents. Well, that's amazing because you're describing, you know, the, the career, the journey of a true entrepreneur where you have your successes and you have your failures and then you learn from your failures and then, but you keep going, right? And you keep going inspired and you're surrounded yourself. You've been in such great environments, rich environments with curiosity and uh, with the ability to let that curiosity flourish and develop and, and given tools where, where you can um, be able to do these things. And then you 
do it yourself for others as well, you know, like working, collaborating with fellows that you've, you've had students and then um, really bringing new knowledge and new, new um, ways of treating our patients. And talking about that, you have this wonderful uh, vagal nerve stimulator. Um, historically, a lot of the stimulation, you know, you can do like some of the uh, of outside just just touching and, and doing certain movements and things like that. And then implants were the other thing, but you've been able to do this uh, device. Can you describe it for us? Sure. So the device that um, I uh, work on, I'm chief medical officer of the company called ElectroCore, uh, E-L-E-C-T-R-O core, C-O-R-E. And you can find it at electrocore.com makes a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator. And I think the um, really, we've got a whole bunch of patents, uh, 130 some odd patents with worldwide um, coverage on the best way of stimulating the vagus nerve in the neck without having to do surgery. And I started this uh, path and uh, looking at this with a good friend, JP Erico. Uh, and JP was a serial entrepreneur, and I was a serial scientist, so to speak. And um, he had been thinking about the vagus nerve, and I had been thinking about the vagus nerve for a different reason. Uh, my son, I learned, had peanut allergies. And as an anesthesiologist, <clears throat> you're, you, I know you know that when you see a kid with um, having an asthmatic attack or an, uh, uh, some kind of anaphylaxic reaction, one of the things we try to do is keep them calm, not just because it's the nice thing to do, but also because of the anxiety can actually exacerbate the airway reactivity. And I wondered deeply, well, why is that? Um, is there a way to harness that neural activation that is clearly is occurring uh, with the vagus nerve? Uh, went to the lab with a good friend, Chaz Emila, who uh, was with me at Hopkins and moved to Columbia and did some studies on the vagus nerve in airway reactivity. And we actually showed that we could block the airway activity from histamine infusions by vagus nerve stimulation. Initially, it was open. And then later, uh, Bruce Simon really figured out how to do this non-invasively uh, as part of our, our company. Uh, so we could potentially have a handheld therapy that could control or activate the vagus nerve. Now, over the last, I'd say, 15 years or so since of that development, we have figured out that the vagus nerve is extraordinarily important. For the anesthesiologist, it's not just that structure that gets in the way when we place a central line. It is the command and control center from everything from inflammation in the body, uh, controls neuroinflammation in the brain with things like Parkinson's disease and post-traumatic stress disorder. There's information on the vagus nerve and anxiety and depression. There's information on gastrointestinal discomforts. So um, we've been working with partners in, who are experts in the field in their respective disciplines, utilizing our device to try to understand that if vagus nerve stimulation can improve health, wellness, and disease. It's it's amazing where you, you know, you start on one path, you think that you're going one way and you discover so many other things. Um, I, my experience with the, um, with the vagal nerve stimulator has been for headaches uh, for my patients when I've been treating them for headaches and it's been quite successful. I do have a child who's had headaches and it has helped them. Um, I've had... Um, a mother who had a post COVID problems and it really helped her. Yeah. And I would love to discuss some of those other um, uses that you've seen that you have, you know, we have 131 patents for that. So let's discuss some of those, how you discovered them specifically. And well, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned, we started with airway reactivity and we were studying the device in patients with status asthmaticus and a patient reported my headache went away. That prompted us to actually kind of pivot and start to really dive into headache management. We now have, I think seven or 
or so uh, clearances from the FDA on various headache disorders. So for example, we have an approval for acute treatment or what's called a clearance for acute treatment of episodic cluster headache, a prevention of cluster headache, acute treatment of migraine, prevention of migraine, adult treatment of adolescent migraine, treatment of paroxysmal hemicrania, treatment of hemicrania continuum. Um, and that's really been a, you know, a solid foothold where the device is somewhat actually commonly used now with our veterans. We, we still struggle with private insurers, but I think we have close to 20 million lives covered now in the private world or they can get access to it. But um, we also created it really what's a, a cash pay business so patients can get access to the therapy while insurance companies relook at things and and decide that it's not quote investigational and experimental, which is the go-to thing for a lot of insurance companies, unfortunately. Tell me about the discovery related to the COVID, you know, which I think is just an extension of the previous discoveries that you had. It's just a new application. Well, yeah. So um, when COVID hit, as you recall, it was for, for me, it was January, February. I started to learn about this in 2020. Um, it, it became immediately obvious to me that um, what was killing people was two things. Number one, there was a pulmonary problem where patients were not getting ventilated adequately. And the second was the cytokine storm. And the the first aspect of that uh, care uh, was we were run, running out of ventilators. And I knew from the work that we had done on our airway reactivity that I could bronchodilate patients with status asthmaticus or inflammatory response. Uh, and I also knew that there was a body of work on bacterial infections indicating that a bacterial infection uh, could cause a cytokine storm and it could be blocked by the vagus nerve stimulation. It had not been known whether or not uh, the stimulation of the vagus nerve in a viral infection could block a cytokine storm. We actually did that study and we were the first to show that vagus nerve stimulation could block a cytokine reaction in, with a virus, and we've filed patents on that as well. But um, we submitted something to the FDA in probably April and got an emergency use authorization from the FDA on uh, vagus nerve stimulation, non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation as a treatment for the airway reactivity thought to be due to an exacerbation of asthma, really based on our early, early work without any direct uh, data, well, that's not true. There was a little bit of direct data on vagus nerve stimulation in patients with airway reactivity with acute COVID. But again, there was really nothing uh, out there, but the FDA granted at least uh, patients to get access to the therapy. And a number of our colleagues were actually treated with this. And some of them uh, have indicated to me that they think that it saved their lives when they were hospitalized with acute COVID and markedly changes in their, in their oxygenation. So, um, you know, the, the initial path was we, we studied it, we published a paper uh, on, in neuromodulation. Uh, it was the most downloaded paper uh, in that year, in 2020, uh, in journal neuromodulation. I got the FDA emergency use authorization and started some studies. One was with uh, Carlos Tornero in Spain who did the study that showed that we could modulate C-reactive protein in subpopulations, changes in D-dimer were noted, IL-6 were noted, uh, and uh, now there's work going on on long COVID. Uh, the group up at Mayo Clinic Rochester is studying uh, uh, our device in long COVID as a potential treatment for what I suspect is a neurological injury that may include vagal nerve damage uh, in patients who are suffering with long COVID. So this is just, a, as you said earlier, it's a path from idea to evaluating what's going on in the world, seeing that we need a better mousetrap, so to speak, and then building it. What's the pathway you're suspecting for that? Um, or sorry, what are the symptoms for those patients that you're saying that they have for long COVID, um, the vagal nerve damage? 
What are the symptoms for this for these patients? So, so long COVID is a really a tremendous problem. There's probably 100 million people uh, uh, worldwide, and that data is a little old now, so it's probably more than that, uh, who have long COVID. And long COVID is an incredible problem. Uh, it, some of the estimates, Dr. Summers, who is um, uh, from, from Harvard, has, rec- has recently estimated that there's something like $16 trillion worth of damage expected from long COVID itself. It's really an enormous number, and I, I, I don't know if it'll be that high, but in terms of lost productivity, work-related injuries, disability payments, it's an enormous number that is expected to become come from this next pandemic of long COVID. Now, now long COVID is probably a constellation of different disorders that are all presenting similarly. You know, I had COVID and now I'm disabled, but it's probably three or four different mechanisms that are occurring. But but one of them is probably due to a damage of the vagus nerve, interestingly enough. And people can have persistent cough, they can have gastrointestinal problem. The number one thing that people experience with long COVID is fatigue. Uh, number two is, is headache disorders. Uh, and interestingly, these are all areas where the vagus nerve has been shown to be implicated over the past. Another, of course, is POTS and autonomic dysfunction. These are uh, areas that the vagus nerve, again, I think is implicated in. And there's some uh, uh, thought from a European group that in these patients with long COVID, if you measure vagal nerve activity, it's significantly depressed in a large percentage of patients with long COVID related symptoms. So I think that there's gonna turn out to be an opportunity to treat patients with long COVID with vagus nerve stimulation. Right now it's arguably on label for the for one of the bigger subset of uh, patients with long COVID, it's those with migraine. But more work is going on uh, to try to figure out whether or not uh, vagus nerve stimulation can be part of the cure uh, or a solution for patients with long COVID. Too early that's to tell, am- but it that's, is. That's amazing. No, no, it's, it's true. Like it's so involved, the vagus nerve in so many things. One of the things that I was really curious about this device um, now that I'm done a transition to treat my patients through functional medicine is the fact that you have a patent for uh, telomere lengthening. And um, I'm very curious about how the idea came about. I think I would have an idea thinking, uh, you know, like maybe treating um, anxiety and depression and and that type of, of, um, you know, the stress will help you uh, lengthen your telomeres. What have you found? What made you choose this, uh, this path? Well, that patent's been filed and people can find it and search it. It's not been issued yet. But what made me think about it was um, uh, sitting in on a lecture on the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn, uh, who uh, is the person credited with understanding that stress, anxiety, uh, all affect telomere function. And when we start to put together the information that she had and the information that I have about how the vagus nerve controls stress and anxiety, it becomes um, uh, an interesting implication to suggest that we can improve survival with telomere lengthening through vagal nerve stimulation. So it was really listening to people from very disparate areas, not related to my specialty at all, uh, to start to say, can we draw new implications forward using what I know from my deep knowledge of the vagus nerve and neuromodulation and trying to understand what other people are working on to say, is there any kind of implication for the work that we're doing in their space? And that's part of what I think, uh, of how I think we develop innovative ideas is by trying to be broadly read about different areas. That's that's a very important point um, that you bring up because as an entrepreneur, you have you know you can find inspiration within your field, but really to advance and to grow, you have to to open the windows. And that's one of the things as physicians that keep us you know in burnout is that we're always not always, but 
you know, you go through medicine and then you're focused on medicine, treating, you know, learning how much, as much as you can to treat your patient, staying there on that lane without really opening your windows to other information. In your case, you've done a lot within the, the pain management anesthesiology, but as you say, you, you know, you have, you have crossed, you know, paths with, with other people and other fields, and you have to do it as an, as an entrepreneur to be able to grow and, and take your ideas to, to bigger levels. Let's talk about now, because we talked a lot about science and, and we love that part and we're both passionate about that, but let's talk about tips, you know, like things that along the way you have learned, especially if somebody's thinking, you know what, I have this idea for this device. We've talked about patents. We've talked about FDA approval. We've talked about uh, collaborations. If you're somebody, if you're a physician who's thinking about, um, you know, I have an idea for this particular device. What, uh, what advice would you give them right now? You know, the most important things to think about or things to avoid. Well, um, I mentioned, we just, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. (laughs) Well, we we talked this morning about the idea with a Cutenza patch starting literally in the early 1990s. And it was just this morning where I saw the commercial on TV uh, for Cutenza. These are incredibly long and laborious pathways. And I think that there are various opportunities and various strategies that you need to evaluate in yourself about what are your strengths and what do you like to do and how do you want to push forward. Um, I, I found that for myself, I'm more of an idea person. I like to come up with new concepts and new strategies and then really partner with people who are really good at other things. Partner with lawyers who are really good at you know patent applications partner with business people who are really good at raising money, partner with regulatory people who are really good at taking something through a pathway, partner with um, 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 a a large group of people who have skill sets that I don't have, nor do I really actually want to acquire. I I want to spend my time doing what I want to do. So this works really well for me, but understand this is a path to, I'll say, get rich very slowly. I don't mean rich by money, but I mean to really build something out, it takes time. And I think that's one of the key, the key um, messages here. It's not like, oh, I have an idea. It's now worth a hundred million dollars. It does. It just doesn't work that way. You have an idea and that is the very basis of what you start with, but there's a lot more that goes into developing a product. It's just an incredible incredible journey that requires expertise from lots and lots of different areas. So my first lesson is hire people who have expertise that you don't have and then let them do their job. That's great. So building great teams and, you know, in your acknowledging first that you don't know everything, (laughs) right? And not wanting to do everything and learn everything because then that takes you away from doing the things that you're good at. Yeah. Uh, when you're submitting um, things to the FDA, you require you require at, at that point. But that point, you should be really informed of the many things that you're you're needing, um, and you should have early on. Were there any mistakes in submitting to the FDA that you say I look back and then I should have done this or this better? Um, despite getting to that step already, you know, oh, I'm so ready to go this, but I missed this thing. Um, Is there anything that happened to you like that? Um, Well, you know, when I was on the board uh, of Electricor, I I think, let me just say, I think there's, uh, when you go to the FDA with a new plan for a new drug or device, listen carefully to what they're saying. Uh, They're trying to help you get through the system here. And uh, I think that we need to start for an FDA submission with a really focal uh, application on a smaller subset of disorders. But as you, it may be a different, um, maybe a different study that you need for FDA approval or, or clearances than it is for selling in the, the marketplace. Insurers really care very little about 
just having had an FDA approval, they really want demonstrative efficacy in their population of patients. So it's important to understand the pathway that you're going down from idea to development of a drug or device to doing a study to submitting it to the FDA to what is called the valley of death the time from which you've got a FDA approval or clearance of a device or therapy to the time that you can actually make money from that device, which requires typically insurance coverage or a sales plan. Um, in, in Typically in the medical field, you typically want to have insurance coverage. Thinking through the current pathways that are out there for, for coverage of various devices or drugs, are there uh, predicates that what you can uh, build upon, or you can create a whole new pathway for yourself. And these are the process that you need to think through at the very outset when you've got an idea to the time that you want to be selling out there and building a sales team and marketing team out there. You need to think through the entire process before you do your first patient. One thing that I've seen with some other devices is that they have the FDA approval, they have all the investors, they go to these shows. And there's not necessarily that great of a physician or clinician adoption of the therapy, which can happen. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I mean, I think um, part of what we did with ElectroCore more recently over the last couple of years was to recognize that we need to align incentives of physicians, patients, and industry. Uh, um, particularly while uh, insurers, in my mind, are being unreasonable and calling these effective therapies investigational and experimental. And physicians are busy people. They've got to make a living. Uh, and I think it's okay for doctors to make money. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of doctors making money. But when a doctor has to go through a lot of paperwork or regulatory pathways or um, fill out a form for an insurance company who just then denies it, Doctors will lose interest and go down plan B and try to come up with something else. It's human nature. But if you can make a path that's very easy for the page, for the physician and cover the expenses of their time and filling out the paperwork and distributing a device, uh, that's got a tremendous advantage. And an electrocore, uh, Mitch Deshawn and uh, Dan Goldberg, our head of sales and our, and our CEO, came up with a plan, what's called GammaCore Concierge, that I think you know about is where the device can be sold to the physician, the physician then can sell it to the patient and uh, at a very reasonable price, the, 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 the physician makes a little bit of money for the, to cover the time of, their, of teaching the patient and um, all of that goes into that. The patient gets a good price and then the company can actually sell. So it is truly aligning the incentives of all parties in this. It's amazing because right now thinking about Gamma core concierge versus that time when you were thinking about vagal nerve stimulation for your son with peanut allergies, like that doesn't match, right? Like no. you were never thinking about that. And here you are, you know, thinking how to, now you have proven a, a device that's wonderful for so many treatments and then just being creative about how to bring that uh, for patients to get access. So that's, that's amazing. We're going to be closing here shortly. Any final thoughts for physicians who want to learn about entrepreneurship? And before that, just one another question. How do you think entrepreneurship has um, allowed you to present in front of your patients? Well, you know, sometimes people are concerned that if you're an investor in a company or uh, if you uh, developed a new technology and it's now being sold to them that you have a financial conflict of interest. And I'm, I'm always very cognizant of that. But overall, patients are actually pretty intrigued that my doctor developed this, my doctor invented this, and they're okay with it. But I am a, uh, I am a huge advocate for full disclosure. So in fact, early on in my Qtenza days, I was feeling less comfortable about it because I was getting royalties. Um, and I didn't really want to have the conversation with patients about, hey, I invented this and I'll get paid a uh, dollar or whatever it is um, every time a Qtenza patch goes on. 
but over time, um, and, and what I did early on is I referred those patients to my colleagues who could be as objective as possible about this. Um, but overall, I, I just don't think people really, um, uh, they, they, they're, they don't look askance at it. They actually think, oh, my doctor's pretty uh, innovative and was able to develop something that's used widely. And I, I kind of like that. Well, that's my impression. I do think one of the key things for lectures, for getting involved in anything is that it's really important to have disclosure. And I, I'm a big fan of disclosing that if you have a financial conflict of interest, it's okay. It's good. Um, wouldn't you want um, Elon Musk to be lecturing about how to build an electric car? Or wouldn't you want um, uh, Thomas Edison to talk about how he came up with the idea of electricity? Uh, you wouldn't not want to have them. And, and similarly, I think in the world of innovation in medicine, we've gone a little too far to say, well, if you've developed a new technology, you can't talk about it. It's, it's just, it's kind of nonsensical. Well, I have to tell you that I, I've seen patients that you've seen, you know, they migrate here to Florida and they come, oh, I've seen Dr. Peter Stats. And the things that they tell me about Dr. Peter Stats and any of these uh, innovators is that, oh, my doctor travels the world. Oh, my doctor invented this or my doctor did that. It's like, and then, you know, um, it's, it's really, um, it's an honor to take care of these patients who, who have seen that. And it's, it, they feel really happy that their doctor is such, you know, an important figure in the field that is helping them because they know that their doctor knows what the best thing is out there. Uh, and and they, I think they do feel that it's in their best interest because they know that they're with knowledgeable people. That's the way I see it from my point of view, not being an innovator um, to this sense. So, so thank you for all the work that you do. Yeah, thanks. Thank thanks for everything that you've done for, for our career, for our patients, for our field of interventional pain management. And any final thoughts before we go? And how can people connect with you? Well, sure. I, you know, two final thoughts is always be curious. Don't take what everybody else says as status quo, uh, as as being verbatim of what we need to do. When we stop and we think about it, uh, there's an old saying that 50% of everything you learned in medical school is wrong. I just can't tell you which 50%. And it's really true that there's a lot of development that goes on and continually challenge yourself uh, on the next idea. And the second thing I would say for, for the innovator and general clinician is never look at the patient as an ATM. The patient, it is an incredible honor to care for patients and put money aside when you're taking a look at this patient um, right now uh, in every case and do the best by your patient in every setting. And if you follow those pathways, you'll have a very happy and interesting life forever. You may not make as much money as you could otherwise, but you'll stay out of jail and you will uh, help the most people and you'll have a very, very rewarding career. That's awesome. Thank you very much for those thoughts. Where can people connect with you if they want to connect with you? Where can they get ElectroCore? Uh, you go to electrocore.com. And if you want to reach me about uh, anything to do with vagus nerve stimulation, you can reach me uh um, really at it, on any of the topics we've talked about at peterstotts at hotmail.com. I'd be happy to talk to you and, and respond to you that way. Well, thank you for being here today. Thanks for your time and, and everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pradal. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And thank, congrats on your wonderful podcast. This is a great success, great entrepreneurial effort. Thank you. Well, guys, that's it for today. I hope you had a wonderful time as I did with Dr. Peter Stats. You can actually learn more about this vagal nerve stimulator through electrocore.com. We're going to be working, still working on bringing you all these topics so that you can learn about entrepreneurship. And I hope that you had so much fun as we did as well. Check out our website, maxalur.com, M-A-X-A-L-L-U-R-E. And I hope that you share this with your family and friends. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Please remember that design is not providing specific financial, medical, or career advice. Our only intent is to stimulate your appetite for growth by sharing our experience and those of our speakers, coaches, and guests. Your personal growth and success will be unique to your circumstances and your hard work. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the show and look forward to seeing you next week.